Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about flowering plants. I don't know what you know about flowering plants, but um, I think you'll find that they're a lot more complex and interesting than maybe even you imagined. So in today's lecture, we're going to talk about um, their life cycle. We're going to talk about flowers, how flowers are arranged, the evolution of flowers. We're going to talk about uh, how um, flowers are pollinated. We'll talk also about seeds and how seeds are germinated and dispersed. So you've already seen this life cycle before. We looked at it last lecture and um, and uh, I just wanted to review it with you real quickly because it's an important thing to understand uh, generally how it's organized. So you should be uh, studying this. You should be making sure that you um, can uh, can sketch this out. This is in the study guide. So you're definitely responsible for knowing it. And uh, we could start anywhere in the life cycle. So why don't we start uh, right here at the anther and the, um, and the ovary. So uh, inside the anther, there are these cells called microspore mother cells that are going to undergo meiosis to produce microspores. And these microspores are going to undergo mitosis to form a pollen grain, which will be the kind of like the mature um, male gametophyte. Uh, it's reduced down to a number of cells, three cells, and uh, this pollen grain will eventually make its way to, um, to the stigma of a of a female part and uh, and a pollen tube so the little the little pollen grain will stick there and a pollen tube will grow down until it reaches um, the uh, ovules so let's go over here and talk about the female part so inside of the ovary there are these little structures called uh, ovules and uh, inside the ovule there's going to be cells called uh, megaspore mother cells that are going to undergo meiosis to produce megaspores. The megaspore will undergo mitosis and it's going to basically form a female gametophyte and it's going to be made of something in the order of seven cells. Uh, one of those cells of course will be an egg cell which can be fertilized to become um, you know um, a zygote. So if we make it down here to this particular part of the of the chart the sperm cell as you can see is uh, the sperm cell is has made its way all the way through that pollen tube and it's made its way to the egg cell there's actually two sperm cells that are formed one sperm cell will uh, unite with the egg nucleus the other sperm cell will unite with another cell and form what we call the endosperm the endosperm is a material that will feed the young embryo um, as it's growing inside the seed and then as it grows um, once the seed germinates. So once the egg and sperm unite they form a zygote. The zygote will eventually undergo lots of mitosis and will form an embryo. So inside of this structure here uh, we're forming a seed. The seed has a seed coat, it has a food supply, and it has the embryo. And this is a pretty complex structure that allows for plants to, um, to live better on land. Remember, plants started out as being aquatic, and in the transition uh, in, onto land, um, they had to become more terrestrial and survive drying out. The seed aids in that particular function. So once the seed uh, matures and it's planted or, uh, or, or finds the, a, a suitable uh, ground to, uh, to germinate, it will germinate and it too will produce at some point in time flowers. So that is the life cycle of a plant. Um, I would definitely make sure you know that, be able to draw it, uh, understand it. And uh, there is this concept down here I also want you to know that is pollination is the carrying of pollen from one flower to another. Fertilization is the combining of the sperm and egg nucleus. So it's the, it's the sperm cell coming down and, uh, and joining with the uh, egg. Now what I wanted to do is kind of show you some pictures of what I just talked about in that life cycle. So um, uh, we'll start with the male um, part first. Remember the male part is called the stamen. The stamen is the male part that is composed of the filament and the anther. The filament's a little stalk that holds the anther up. The anther is going to be the portion that's going to have cells that will undergo meiosis to produce the microspores. So 
if we were to take and, uh, and, and look at this through a uh, microscope, if you were to section an anther and look at it through the microscope, this might be what it looks like. So inside of the uh, anther, there are going to be cells called megaspore mother cells. Now these megaspore mother cells are diploid and they have to undergo meiosis to produce haploid um, microspores. So eventually we want to form microspores. A microsporocyte is another name for, uh, for microspore mother cell. But these microsporocytes being diploid have to undergo meiosis to produce haploid microspores. And that occurs at the anther, at the head of the anther. So once these, uh, these uh, microspores uh, are kind of like uh, somewhat mature and ready to be dispersed, they kind of look like this. So you can see some of them that have um, been formed. And these pollen grains will be released. Sometimes they stick to um, pollinators. Sometimes they are going to um, uh, float in the wind. Maybe they'll be in water as well. So there's different ways that the pollen can get from one flower to the next. This is what uh, one of these uh, gametophytes looks like. So it has a, uh, a tube cell nucleus and it has a generative cell nucleus. The generative cell nucleus will divide by mitosis to eventually form two sperm cells. So the mature gametophyte um, is going to only be three cells in size. Now, if you remember back to bryophytes and the mosses, the gametophyte was huge. I mean, you could see it, you could feel it, and it was made of, of uh, you know, probably millions of cells. Um, this is only a three-cell gametophyte. So in the trend of uh, the evolution of plants, we have now reduced the gametophyte to three cells. The tube cell will form a tube that will grow down and take the sperm cells um, that are going to be formed to the, um, to the ovule. So this is showing you the uh, ovule development. So here we have the ovary. Let's see if I can change my color here. So here we have the ovary is going to be this part that's going to contain the uh, ovules. The ovules are each of these little circular things that you can see in here. Inside of the ovules are where you're going to have your um, megaspore mother cells. So if we were to take and cut into an ovule, we're going to find that there are megaspore mother cells. Here's one here and here's one here. The megaspore mother cells, uh, you know, are uh, diploid. So we have to undergo meiosis to produce haploid um, megaspores. And so um, what I've done is taken you a little bit later in development. So the megaspore mother cell in this particular graphic has already undergone um, the megaspore mother cell has undergone meiosis and it produced a um, megaspore. The megaspore has gone through mitosis to produce this structure here. Inside the structure, there's all kinds of cells that uh, have formed, but uh, as you can see there, and we have the egg cell is the most important one that uh, we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about these polar nuclei. So these, this polar nuclei and this egg cell are going to um, uh, be uh, fertilized by sperm cells and they're going to form the uh, endosperm for this one which is a food supply for the embryo and then this will form the zygote once it's fertilized. Alright so this is a pretty complex structure. This whole thing is the gametophyte and uh, let's see and I count seven cells there is what it's made of. So we've reduced down the gametophyte to seven cells in the in the female lineage and only three cells in the male lineage. If you notice there's a little hole right here in this whole structure called the ovule and that's where sperm cells can actually come in because the tube cell will grow there. And so what I want to do is show you what happens uh, at pollination. So this is pollination. You have the pollen grains that have been um, have been deposited on the stigma. The structure here that I'm outlining is the stigma, and it's sticky. It has a little sticky juice in it, and uh, it catches pollen. So that pollen is not going to, you know, it doesn't like get reabsorbed in here, but it actually grows into the style. So the pollen tube is going to grow this way to take the sperm cells. This is showing you how they have stained with a, with a fluorescent dye. They have stained a pollen grain and they show you the pollen grain stays here and then each pollen grain grows a tube. So this pollen grain over here grew a tube down to um, where the uh, ovules are. 
So that's a lot of growth there. I, I would assume it's just absorbing water and it's it's, it's expanding itself. But um, the sperm cells will be carried down by the tube cell. That's a pretty, if you ever looked at a female plant part, that could be a pretty long uh, way to grow. So you can see there's just hundreds and hundreds of pollen grains here all growing down. Now not all of them will fertilize um, will fertilize a, um, um, an egg, but uh, many of them will. So there's kind of a competition there who can grow the fastest. So this is showing you uh, uh, two graphics here. Let me change my color. So this is showing you a pollen grain and a tube that's growing down to the uh, to the ovule. So when um, when this particular process is happening, the generative cell nucleus will divide and form two sperm cells. So here's a sperm cell here, here's a sperm cell here, and this is just a tube nucleus. The tube nucleus directs the formation of the pollen tube and organizes the instructions to, to form that structure. And this is just showing you, you know, the the different uh, the different uh, pollen grains, and you can see they're growing down. And some flower some flowers have ovules on this side and this side. So all of these tubes are growing down to try to fertilize the um, the uh, egg uh, that's inside the ovule. So you can see these particular sperm cells have made it down. We have the um, the egg cell is right here. So one of the sperm cells will move over and fertilize that egg cell. Another one of the sperm cells will fertilize two other, will join with two other nuclei to form the endosperm. And uh, that's kind of rare. You know, you don't oftentimes see a triploid structure. But in flowering plants, there is a triploid structure that produces the endosperm because three, nucle three nucleuses uh, or nuclei are going to uh, fuse together. Um, this is called double fertilization. It's kind of a unique characteristic in flowering plants. But one sperm cell fuses with an egg. The second sperm cell uh, will fuse with those polar nuclei, which is a two, which is two nuclei, and uh, form the endosperm. Now remember, egg egg plus sperm equals zygote. Okay, that'll be that'll form the next uh, plant generation, and. Uh, and uh, endosperm, uh, the, the polar nuclei plus a sperm cell forms the endosperm, which is a food supply for the uh, growing embryo. And this is just showing you the double fertilization. So, um, so this is what, uh, this is what uh, the structure looks like that the sperm cells are having to move towards. I guess I could highlight that better with, with a white. So this is the structure the sperm cells are moving towards. And... Uh, and if we look over here, we have the sperm, one sperm cell is fertilizing the uh, egg cell, and we have a zygote forming. And then the polar nuclei are being fused with another sperm cell, forming that triploid structure known as the endosperm. And that's the food supply. And just showing you how seeds develop, uh, eventually this, uh, this gametophyte, let's see if I'm having a hard time here with my colors. So... So here is the is the gametophyte, and uh, and that gametophyte's been fertilized. So we have a little embryo, a little two-celled pro-embryo that's forming, and uh, it's just going to get bigger and bigger as time goes on. So this is showing you what it looks like in a little bit later stage. So we have a uh, little pro-embryo that's growing. It is it is you know still attached to the parent plant. This is showing you a little later stage. So you have the um, you have the young cotyledons, these little young embryonic leaves, a little young embryonic root that's forming. Uh, in a little bit later stage, you can see the cotyledons, the young embryonic leaves are getting a little bit bigger, and we have a little bit bigger root tip right there. So it just is basically growing and getting more complex. You do have tissues that begin to form. You can see there's a protoderm, ground marrow stem, procambium. So some of some of these tissues are beginning to form inside the structure. Over here you have um, a mature. So we have the mature embryo that's listed over here. You have the little embryonic leaves here and here. Those are called cotyledons. You have a little shoot apex right there so that the thing can, once it hits sunlight, can grow longer and taller. And we have a radical, which is the, 
the young embryonic leaf. Um, you can see that there is a coating around it. So this is actually a seed with a seed coat around it. And the female provides tissues that form the seed coat. Over, so this is a dicot. This is a dicot, which means it has two cotyledons. Over here we have a monocot because it only has one cotyledon that's located right in this region here. And you can see the young embryo of the monocot right here and here. This is the root, and this is this will be the the, the uh, plumule is the young stem of the root. So if you have ever, I guess you've eaten corn before. This is a corn seed, and that's what an embryo looks like. This is all the stored nutrients over here. These are stored nutrients for the plant to grow before it undergoes photosynthesis. All right, that's pretty de detailed, that's pretty deep. Make sure you follow your study guide for what you ultimately need to be responsible for. Uh, I just wanted to give you a good sense of the complexity of that. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll talk about flowers now. Um, I know many of you received flowers, you know, for, you know, birthdays or, you know, um, uh, Valentine's Day. And uh, you look at them and they're beautiful and they're cool looking, but uh, they're, they're much more complex and intricate structures. There is uh, a lot of different kinds of flowers. They're highly evolved structures. They're very complex organs. And uh, what, what, what I'm going to do is try to give you a little bit of a sense of that, a little bit of an appreciation uh, for the complexity of, uh, of the flower. All right, so this is just a typical flower here. This looks like uh, something like a lily, a tiger lily. And uh, you're familiar with the male part. The male part is the anther and the filament. The female part is made up of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. And flowers also sometimes have flower petals, and they have sepals, and they have a receptacle, and they have a stem. You should be able to draw a generic flower, okay? So you should be able to draw and label a flower. And uh, perhaps I'll just do something like uh, a generic flower over here for you so you know how to do that. So here I'm drawing flower petals. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and draw in some sepals. And uh, this would be the receptacle down here. So in your little flower, you can have a male part, some male parts, and you can have... A female part. So you have the stigma, the style, the ovary, filament, um, and excuse me, the, the filament is this structure right here in the anther, the stamen, and you have sepals, receptacle, and you have a stem. So be able to draw a generic flower and, uh, and uh, be able to know the parts of that. All right, so it looks like I have to erase that so you can stop the video and take a look at it if you like to look at it a little bit longer, but I need to erase it so we can see a few of the parts. So let me erase, 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 erase. Okay. So the pedicel is the stalk of an individual flower. So I was calling it a stem earlier, but it has a specific name called a pedicel, and that holds the flower up so pollinators might have an opportunity to see it. The receptacle is the part of the flower that um, is going to um, bear the floral organs. It kind of is at here at the base. It's the base of the flower and gives the flower strength. The sepals are going to be the outer whorl of um, modified leaves. Usually they're small and green, but sometimes they can be modified to be colorful. Sometimes flowers don't have them. It just depends on that species of flower. The calyx are all the sepals put together. So if you take and you look at the, all the whorl of, of, of these leaves called the sepals, collectively they're called the calyx. We then have the petals, the flower petals, which you can see right here. And uh, that's a second whorl of leaves. And often these are showy. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not even present on some flowers. Um, the, so the, the sepals and the petals and the stamens and the, and the carpels, all of these we know the genetic code for. There are genes that code for the production of these whorls of leaves. And if you knock those, those genes out, you don't have a whorl of leaves. So that's pretty well worked out genetically. The corolla is all the petals put together collectively. Uh, I actually drive a Toyota Corolla, and uh, if you've never knew what a Corolla 
uh, refers to. It's uh, not a uh, it's not a Japanese name. It's actually uh, it means flower a collection of flower petals, which I think is kind of cool. The perianth is the calyx and the corolla collectively put together. So these are terms that we use for um, for flowers. And here's the perianth down here in this bottom drawing. Okay. So um, those are some some names, so you can begin to appreciate that uh, every one of those parts is named and uh, has a function to it. So the stigma's job is to catch pollen, and uh, the stigma is right here, and it's a female part, and it's sticky to catch pollen. The style connects the stigma to the ovary, and uh, you can see the style down here in this tiger lily. The ovary is the basal portion of a pistil, and uh, it contains the ovules, so the ovules will eventually contain uh, egg cells. The stamen is the male part of the flower, so it contains the anther and the uh, filament. The anther is the part that uh, makes pollen grains, and then the filament is the stalk of the stamen, so that it can hold the, um, <clears throat> the anther up high to get to pollinators. The pistil is a collective term for all the carpels. So a carpel is a, a structure that has a stigma style and ovary, but some, some flowers might have uh, more than one carpel. All the carpels put together, uh, the collective term for all carpels is the pistil. Some flowers have um, uh, one carpel only, and they have a, what we call a simple pistil. Other flowers are composed of two or more carpels, some have three or four or five or six, and uh, those are called compound pistils. So they get to be pretty complex, some of these flowers. So the carpal is the female reproductive organ. As I said earlier, it's made of the stigma style and the ovary. A pistil is the collective term for all carpels. And we have the simple pistil is composed of one carpel. A compound pistil is made of two or more uh, fused carpels. So if you look at these pictures over here on the side, this particular flower here has three simple pistils. Here's pistil number one, pistil number two, pistil number three, and it has three carpels. Okay, remember a carpel is... Um, the stigma style and ovary, a pistil is, uh, is a collective term for all the carpels. So if you just have separate pistils, then uh, separate carpels, each one of these is a separate carpel, then each of those is a separate pistil. But look what happens to this particular flower down here in the bottom graphic. Here we have three carpels. So we have stigma style ovary, three carpels. You can see carpel number one, carpel number two, carpel number three. But they are fused together, so they make one compound pistil. Okay, so these are the fused carpels, and that's a that's a pretty complex, highly evolved. Um, that's a very high, highly evolved pistil. Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about placentation for a second. Placentation is a term that we use for the arrangement of of ovules within the ovary. The ovaries are attached to a placenta. Okay, a placenta is going to be uh, an attachment point to the parent plant where nourishment can uh, be exchanged. So, you know, we have a placenta too. You were connected to a placenta and got nourishment from your mother, and uh, the ovules get nourishment from their parent plant as well. So there are, and, and I'm just showing you this for the for the simple joy and complexity and how how cool flowers actually are. Um, there are different uh, types of placentation. You have parietal placentation, axial placentation, and free central placentation. In axial placenta placentation, the ovules are attached to the wall. Okay, you can see that they are attached to the wall of the ovary, as you can see there. In the axial placentation, the ovules are attached to some central part of the of the wall uh, of the ovary so it's not attached to the wall but it's attached to a central portion and then in free central placentation there's a structure a central structure that the ovules are attached to you may have never appreciated this um, directly 
But when you go to cut up, a, you know, next time you make a salad and you go to uh, make, um, you know, cut up a bell pepper or cut up an apple or you cut um, a tomato up, you can actually see this placentation. And it gives you a general sense of the of the complexity of that particular um, that particular fruit, and uh, so this would be like kind of like the less evolved. This would be like the most evolved. So we started out relatively simple and got super complex with this free central placentation. Okay, just showing you a couple of. Um, of, of these uh, examples here. So this will be an example of parietal placentation. I'm sure some of you have eaten peas before, but peas in a pod, they have the placenta right here on the margin and the ovules are attached right to the margin. So that would be an example of, of um, the uh, parietal placentation. And this is the more simplistic form. Uh, just showing you another example of uh, parietal placentation. Here we have a cucumber, so you can see it's attached to the wall of the ovary, which is kind of cool. And many, most of you have eaten cucumbers before. When you slice into a cucumber, you now understand that this, this is the placenta up here, and these are the, these are the, the seeds, but there were once ovules, and uh, they derive nourishment from the parent plant. It's kind of cool. This is the axial placentation, and uh, I believe this is a um, is a um, a tomato. It looks like to me, and uh, you can see the the placentas here, kind of in a, in a in a um, in the center area, um, but it's still attached, so it's not it's not free central, um, like you'll see in just a second. And here you have the ovules, and this is the placenta. So here is more of an example of like uh, uh, like a bell pepper, and uh, so this shows you the um, the axial placentation with the ovules on the outside. And then here's your free central placentation. That's where it's just in the center area, and uh, you have the ovules that are on the outside. So that's kind of like the most advanced that you can see. Okay. So let's talk about the different kinds of flowers. So, some flowers, and, and I know it sounds like I'm saying sunflowers, but I'm actually saying some flowers. Some flowers have all four floral organs. They have sepals, they have petals, they have stamens, and they have... Um, um, carpels and they're called complete incomplete means they're lacking one or more of those particular organs perfect flowers means they have both uh, stamens and pistils and imperfect flowers means they either have stamens or they have um, pistils Let's see what I've done here. Let me go back and just start this again. My apologies. Okay, so so you can have uh, you can have both stamens and uh, and uh, pistils, and uh, those are going to be um, perfect flowers, or you can have either stamens or pistils, but not both, and be imperfect. So this flower here is a complete flower, and uh, that means it has all floral organs. So you can see it has stamens, pistils, it has, it has uh, sepals and petals. And uh, this flower over here is incomplete uh, because it is missing, um, in this example, it's missing the uh, female part. So in imperfect flowers, where they're missing one of the male or female parts, you can have staminate flowers, which means they have only stamens. And you can have pistil pistillate flowers, which means they only have pistils. And some flowers are going to be monoecious, and that means that uh, they have both staminate and pistillate flowers. So they have both male and female flowers on the same plant. Other plants, though, may be dioecious, which means they have only staminate male or 
pistillate female flowers. So yeah, plants can be male or female, or they can be hermaphroditic and have both male and female um, parts. So if we look at a monoecious plant here, this would be like an example would be like corn. Corn has the male flowers and the female flowers on the same plant, so it's monoecious. So a dioecious plant will have, um, so it'll have uh, male parts and uh, female parts, but they'll be on separate flowers. Aren't flowers cool? Okay, so probably the, we're just finished up with a couple more concepts of flowers. Again, I'm just showing you the, the deep complexity uh, in arrangement of these things so you could appreciate that. So, um, so flowers, in terms of the way their, um, their ovary is arranged and how their parts insert, um, there are three different categories of these. And I, I won't test you on these names, this hypogenous and, and uh, epigenous and all this other stuff. But I just want you to appreciate that when you look at a flower and you dissect out a flower, that um, there's all different kinds of arrangements because of the, the deep evolution that's occurred in these things. So in this uh, hypo hypogenous flower, we have uh, the, the kind of the um, ancestral condition um, where the, the ovary is superior, the flower parts are attached below the ovary. So we see the flower parts are attached below the ovary, the ovary is superior. So that would be more of a primitive flower. So your more advanced flowers have, uh, have an inferior ovary, so and the flower parts are above it. And then sometimes you have kind of an intermediate thing where you have like a, a little, a little um, fused um, container of parts. And uh, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily inferior, but uh, the flower parts do still come up above it. So um, that's kind of like an in-between. And this is just showing you that, uh, that the, the superior ovary is the least advanced. The most advanced would be the inferior ovary. So if you ever dissect a flower out, you can see a gradual transition from very simple flowers to very complex flowers. And then everything in between. Flowers also have symmetry. If you've, I'm sure you've probably noticed this before. So they're, uh, you know, they have radial symmetry where you can cut them like a pizza in many different directions. And uh, so this blue-eyed grass here, which we have in this area, it can be cut in many different ways to get equal halves, and it has what we call a radial symmetry. Um, but then there's other flowers that can be cut only one way to get equal halves, and those are called bilaterally symmetrical flowers. And these tend to be the more advanced flower. So over here you can see an orchid. You can only cut it one way to get, uh, to get uh, the symmetry. So um, over here, snapdragon's the same way, and then this pipe vine is the same way as well. And uh, lastly, if you ever study flowers, which, which should be, you know, a, a worthwhile use of your time, um, there's all different kinds of arrangements about how flowers cluster. You can have umbels, compound umbels, you can have corms, you can have catkins. Okay, so there's a wide range of, uh, of ways that, uh, that flowers can be arranged. Okay, so I hope you appreciate a little bit of the complexity of flowers, and those are just a few ideas about how they're complex. In a trend of evolution of flowers, we have a reduction in flower parts. We have a fusion of organs. These are things or patterns that you can see by going back and looking at the fossil record and, uh, and studying this. We can see these particular patterns. Regular towards irregular symmetry, so more of a radial symmetry towards a bilateral symmetry. Uh, simple towards compound pistils, so so just having you know uh, simple um, carpels, stigmal style ovary, and just few of them to having compound pistils where they're all fused together. Uh, superior to inferior ovary, so that's just a general trend in the evolution of flowering plants. Uh, one last time to refresh your memory. Remember, all these parts derive from leaves. They're leaf parts that are modified. So you can see that the, the earliest stamens uh, were going to be leaf-like, and they would have the tissues that would uh, create the pollen on the leaf. 
over time the leaf is reduced to where we don't see the leaf anymore we just have the anther and the filament so that's how uh, the evolution of the stamen is thought to have happened the evolution of the carpal uh, we start out with uh, with the uh, female uh, parts that produce the uh, the eggs on the outside surface of a leaf the leaf folds it folds more and reduces down and becomes really super complex with fusion of multiple parts of um, of uh, the carpals and just to show you a couple of, uh, of th this is one of the most complex flowers that you can find here so note that the stamens and filaments are fused around the style this is a hibiscus flower this is a highly evolved flower and uh, this is one of the most highly evolved reproductive parts you can see where the female parts and the male parts have fused together super duper complex okay well let's move on and talking about monocot versus dicot flowers so in monocot flowers you have parts that are in threes and dicots you have parts that are in fours and fives so if you notice you can count three sepals three petals over here you can count uh, one two three four five petals one two three four five five sepals so that's how you go about counting those parts and uh, so in this particular flower you can see petal number one two and three so that gives a good indication that it is a monocot you can see uh, stamen number one two three four five six so again there are multiples of three in the flower over here you can see one two three four five parts and uh, I can't see all this let's see one two three four five six seven eight there's eight stamens over here that I can see okay pollination is a really important concept it's the carrying of pollen from one flower to the next if that doesn't happen then uh, oftentimes the flower won't um, be able to uh, reproduce um, most insects are probably generalist pollinators so most insects will probably you know wherever there's pollen and nectar available they're going to um, they're going to be happy to get the food from uh, from any flower that could be real choosy um, there are specialist pollinators though that are fa fascinating uh, and interesting to study they have co-evolved with uh, certain flowers and uh, these flowers take on certain patterns which are um, which to me are interesting to study and to recognize. So I want you to be uh, um, uh, understand these particular patterns. There's a little video I'll put online for you to take a look at, um, but I'm not going to show it right here right now. So hummingbirds have an interesting pattern and uh, flowers that are pollinated by hummingbirds. Typically, they're going to be red or orange tubular flowers. I, I happen to pick an example that's not red or, or, or orange, which I don't understand why I did that, but I did it. And uh, they, these flowers produce lots of nectar. And uh, if you notice, the, the hummingbird has an extremely long beak and it has an extremely long tongue that can dig in there and get the nectar out. So these have evolved together. This is an example of coevolution. So if the hummingbird goes extinct, this particular flower will go, will go extinct and if this flower goes extinct the hummingbird is done as well so specialist these are species um, that have specialized together and here are some examples of red and orange tubular flowers and uh, sometimes they're they're uh, like thistle here um, the hummingbirds like those as well I don't know if you have a hummingbird feeder but my hummingbirds uh, are coming in regularly right now so bats have a pretty cool pattern. Bat pollinated flowers have a pretty cool pattern. They have strong flowers. They're light colored because bats typically will come out at night. They have tons and tons of nectar. And, uh, and uh, these, uh, these flowers a lot of times will form landing pads. And they have very strong alcohol or fruity um, smells. So bats are flying around at night and they can use their sense of smell to track down these particular flowers. When they land on these flowers, so this is a really strong uh, flower. When they land on these flowers, they will spread, um, they will get pollen all over their chest. You can see in this upper graphic here that the bat is getting pollen all over its chest and uh, spreading uh, pollen from one flower to the next. Um, we don't see a lot of bat pollinated flowers in this area, but we do have a lot of bat pollinated flowers in, uh, in the um, deserts. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Flies, they also like to pollinate flowers too. A lot of times uh, bat, uh, fly pollinated flowers will be uh, symmetrical. They'll have lots and lots of uh, nectar. They are, they are oftentimes dark colored to look like rotting flesh and they produce rotting flesh uh, odors. Here's a little kid sitting beside uh, a large uh, flower and uh, you can see that it's red to look like rotting flesh. I kind of spotted a little bit and it has a rotting odor to it. So you can see just a few flowers here, rotting flesh colors you can see here and here. Uh, and uh, this one doesn't fit the, net, the, the exact pattern that I've stated, but these all down here, this one, this one, and this one have rotting flesh smells. Bees are going to have little landing pads. The flowers have to have little landing pads for them to land on. Um, they oftentimes will have nectar guides and uh, also UV patterns. Nectar guides would look something like this. So if I just drew a simple flower right here, a nectar guide would be little lines or perhaps little spots or little you know darker spots. And uh, in human language, it would be something like this. So these little nectar guides would be like little arrows that point to where to go to get the nectar. So um, there's lots of nectar in these flowers and other pollen rewards. And uh, they're oftentimes yellow, blue, or purple. Uh, red is not a color that uh, insects perceive very well, so we don't see a lot of red flowers that are attracting uh, bees. There are these uh, this very special group of orchids called bee orchids, and uh, they use pseudocopulation uh, pollination. And uh, so what they do is there if you if you notice the the diagrams down below, the little pictures below, this flower light right here to a to a bee looks like a bee. And so this looks like a bee. It even has little hairs, like little, you know, bees have little hairs all over their surface. And what the male bees do is the male bees actually think that these are, um, are female bees, and they will come down and try to mate with the flower petals. The flowers, in addition, will produce uh, chemicals which ma mimic the natural pheromones, the, the, uh, the uh, mating attractant chemicals that bees release. So they release the chemicals in the air, the bee thinks it looks like a bee, it smells like a bee, so it mates with it and when it does it carries pollen from one flower to a next. Now you can think of that almost as parasitism because it's wasting the time of the bee. The bee doesn't get um, anything in return for that. So it does waste the time. I think these flowers are really cool. If you look right here, it actually looks like eyes. Here we have like little eye stalks there, which is kind of cool. And there's a wide range of them. I just picked out a few from what I found on the internet. But look at the coolness of these things. It almost looks like it has antenna coming out. So uh, yellow and black color pattern here. Just cool looking. Um, these, these things are just, uh, to me, they're very awesome looking. And here are some of the UV color patterns. So, um, so if you take a look, this is what humans would see in this black-eyed Susan, but this is what bees perceive if you were to uh, look at these um, in ultraviolet wavelengths. Here's a dandelion, what we see, but this is what a bee sees. Notice the bullseye. So notice the bullseye in this silver weed. We see this, but the, but the bee sees the bullseye. Okay, then you can see the evening primrose has a bullseye. We don't see the bullseye. So, interesting. Be neat to see what uh, bugs see all day long. Beetle pollinated flowers are going to be uh, radially symmetrical. And they're going to have very sturdy uh, anthers, the male part, and they're going to produce lots and lots of pollen because beetles will come and eat the pollen. Ovaries are well protected, though. Uh, from the biting mouth parts of the beetles. They're heavily scented with uh, decaying organic material, uh, the smell of, uh, of, of decaying organic material. Uh, sometimes they'll be fruity or alcoholy or um, more like uh, decaying flesh. Often they're light colored and they're typically large flowers. A lot of times the beetles will come out at night to uh, pollinate them, but sometimes during the day too. So if you have magnolia trees in your yard or you have them near your air, your, where you live, um, magnolia flowers are beetle pollinated flowers and they produce huge amounts of uh, uh, copious amounts of, uh, of pollen. You can see this beetle is being dusted by the pollen.
Now, a lot of times these these plants parasitize the time and effort of the beetles um, by not giving them anything in return, but sometimes the pollen is eaten by the beetle. Just a few other examples of, uh, of beetle pollinated flowers. You can see over here the water lily, here's the magnolia. And uh, we do have a skunk cabbage, which uh, seems to attract beetles pretty well. And uh, wild ginger is around this area. Um, go out, try to find some of these flowers and take a look at them. Are you one of those indoor kids or outdoor kids? Or are you an indoor adult or outdoor adult? Uh, what do you find yourself to be? So I'm an outdoor person. I'm an outdoor kid. Butterflies uh, have red, blue, or yellow, or orange flowers that uh, are, they're attracted to. There's landing pads, and they're typically tubular. If you notice over here, um, this is a butterfly in profile, and this is its mouth part that's coiled up kind of like a hose. So when it goes to a flower, that coiled hose will uncoil so that it can go into a, a tubular flower. And there's a butterfly doing its thing. Moths are going to not have landing pads. They have a strong scent and typically they're lighter white colored because they oftentimes are nighttime pollinators. They too have a long proboscis or beak that they use for pollinating. And that's an awesome, that's an awesome moth right there. And uh, this, is, uh, this is called a uh, hummingbird moth. And this does come out during the daytime, but um, it's large. It oftentimes scares people because they think they're bees or something. But they're huge. And uh, look at that beak. Look at that proboscis going down into the tubular flower. Uh, I've actually seen the hummingbird moths on um, PH campus. So there are flowers that don't have um, they don't have flower petals. They just have male parts or female parts. Here you can see the female part, and here's the male part over here. This is what we call a catkin flower, and uh, all it does is produce pollen and drops pollen. So these oftentimes uh, make people, you know, have the allergies. It's not the insect pollinated flowers that typically get people get allergies to because the pollen's not flying through the air. It's the wind pollinated flowers that are giving people problems. Many of your grasses are wind pollinated. Uh, so this is just showing you flowers, and this appears to be a maple tree with flowers on the end, and uh, these are wind pollinated. There are even some water pollinated flowers that just drop their pollen in water, and it goes from one flower to the next. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about fruit for a second. So fruit are divided into two different groups. We can have fleshy fruits, and they can in, uh, encompass simple or complex fruits. And there are dry fruits. So we'll go ahead and, and look at the anatomy of a fruit over here, just uh, ever so briefly. So a fruit is going to have, of course, seeds. You've all eaten those before. And uh, they're going to have a placenta. And uh, this is the portion inside that the that the seeds will or the ovules were attached to, um, and then there is the 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 pericarp, which is the ovary wall, and uh, so there's an outer, a middle, and an inner layer of the ovary, and we call those esocarps, mesocarps, and endocarps. And different kinds of fruits are going to have different levels of flesh. Some are more fleshy than others. Some are dry and don't have um, fleshy uh, ovary walls. So let's talk about simple fruit. These are fruits which are developed from one ovary, and the flesh is mostly made of ovary tissue. So we have droops, berries, and palms. Droops are single-seeded. The endocarp is typically really, really super hard. And uh, cherries, olives, and coconuts would be example of droops. Many of you have eaten droops before. Maybe you didn't know the name of it. Um, berries include things like tomatoes, grapes, and green peppers, and they're many seeded. Their endocarp is fleshy, so if you've ever enjoyed a green pepper or a grape, you're eating a, what we call technically a berry. And if you've ever eaten an apple or a pear, that is called a palm. 
Complex fruits are fruits which are developed from more than one ovary. So the fruit from many uh, carpels on one single flower is, uh, is how these fruits are developed. And we have aggregate fruits and multiple fruits. Multiple fruits include the pineapples and your mulberries. And then the aggregate fruits would be strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. But these fruits are going to come from carpels of many flowers that are fused together. And then there are fruits that are dry fruits. The fl fruits uh, are going to split open at maturity, and usually there's more than one seed. And uh, an example of a dry fruit would be the legume. So you don't eat pea pods. Well, I guess I do eat pea pods, but, but usually you eat peas. So you don't eat the pod. So legumes are where we're going to split, and it's going to open along two seams in the ovary. And the, the be uh, peas, bean pods, peanuts, these are examples of legumes, but these are dry fruits. The, a capsule is a, where a seed is released through a pore or multiple seams. So poppies, irises, and lilies are examples of, of uh, dry fruits that have capsules. Fruits that do not split open at maturity and usually only have one seed would be what we would call a nut. The pericarp is so hard you're not going to eat it. It's uh, got a lot of scl uh, you know, um, sclerenchyma tissue. It's very hard. Um, and uh, it will be an example would be like an acorn, a chestnut, or a hickory. So you, you can eat these things, but you're not going to enjoy the pericarp that much. Samaras are where the pericarps are thin and they're winged so you've seen the little heli i guess you call them helicopters here's the seed and then there's the little the little winged part of it and uh, maples ashes and elms do this particular have this particular kind of fruit and a keen is where the pericarp is thin and not winged and this would be like a sunflower so a sunflower head just have seeds that come out with no freshy fruit they're no freshy fruit they're just a dry uh, fruit Okay, and you're probably familiar with how seeds are dispersed. You know, plants don't have legs, so they have to get from one place to another, and they are going to use different means of dispersal. These are lots of different examples of seed dispersal using wind. So you're familiar probably with the wings. Okay, and this is a pretty large one. If you notice, there's a ruler right here, and, and uh, that's one of the largest ones that uh, has a wingspan of over, um, over a ruler's length. Uh, most of you have dandelions in your yard. You've seen those blow around. Here's a thistle here. Uh, typically, these things are going to be light. They're going to be feathery. If you look at the uh, milk seed, milkweed seed down here, here's the seed, and it's got feathery, like very light uh, wisps, uh, parts, plant parts that make these little wisps where it can actually fly through the wind. So water dispersal is common too. Here we just have a, an example of the coconut. It floats and can survive in salt water and then land on another island. There are many different kinds of water dispersed seeds and this is just a little collection of them and uh, they will exploit the currents, ocean currents, to spread themselves all over the world. Some seeds are going to be mechanically ejected. So there's touch me nots. When you touch them they shoot the seeds. Uh, and you can see in the graphic up here, you can see that they're shooting the seeds out. Um, here is uh, mistletoe using a, uh, a mechanical ejection. Mistletoe is a parasite we have on plants around in this area. It's very common on uh, Patrick Henry Community College campus. So witch hazel is just shooting the seeds out there. There's a shooting cucumber. So there's all different kinds of ones that use ballistic dispersal. Um, many uh, seeds, though, are eaten by animals, so the animals get the, fruit, the, the, the fleshy fruit as a, as a nutritious snack, and the seeds pass through their intestines, and then they poop the seeds out and disperse the seeds in that kind of way. So there are many seeds that are eaten by animals and uh, pass through their digestive tract. And uh, I did put the squirrel and chipmunk there. A lot of times these will bury seeds like acorns and, and various kinds of nuts. They'll actually bury the seeds and uh, this is called a cached uh, uh, dispersal. And uh, they'll eat many of the seeds, but they'll forget about a lot of them as well. Uh, I'm sure you've walked through a field before and had little spurs stuck on you, little uh, that, that just kind of hang on you. Maybe you've uh, seen cockleburrs before, before, but um, these are just using um, your 
uh, animal fur or your skin or clothing to uh, attach themselves and go from one place to another. Eliasomes are just a really super unique one. I just thought I'd share it with you because we do have some, some plants around here that use eliasomes. But these are, um, are fleshy structures that are attached to seeds. They're, they're rich in lipids and, uh, or fats and proteins. They typically will attract ants. The ants will take the seeds back to their nest, feed on the eliasome, and then the uh, plant will actually grow from its colony. So um, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the, um, the seed that they can't eat will be put on their waste disposal area. If you've ever looked at an ant colony before, they do have places where they uh, have morgues where they where they drop dead ants and uh, and uh, and waste material and sometimes they'll drop the seeds in those areas too and that's a nutritious little ground where it, it can actually grow where there's uh, built-in fertilizer. Sometimes those seeds though will grow from inside the colony so the plants don't uh, the insects don't remove them and the and the seed is planted inside their colony. And I showed you some examples of plants in this area that utilize eliasomes. So bloodroot, violets, trout lily, trillium, spring beauty, all of these are found in our area and they use eliasomes. So this is what an eliasome looks like. It, uh, it's stuck to the seed and you can see it's a nutritious little snack for the ants. The ants will carry it back to their colony. And here's some eliasomes from uh, wood poppies. And, uh, and then they'll take and uh, either bury it or um, put it on their morgue pile or waste pile. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll wrap this up with, by talking a little bit about seeds and seed germination. Okay, so, um, so there are many, uh, so if you look at an embryo inside of a seed, it has many different parts to it. The epicotyl is the stem above the cotyledons. And uh, you can see there is a very small epicotyl right over here in this particular plant. The plumule is the epicotyl in the immature leaves. So that's what the uh, name we give to the, um, the immature leaves. Cotyledons, cotyledons are the embryonic leaves and they're located here and here in this particular graphic. A single cotyledon is a monocot, and uh, dicots have two cotyledons. The cotyledons can be fleshy or more leafy, and they can be kept uh, below the ground or elevated above the ground during germination, depending upon the particular species. The hypocotyl is the stem below the cotyledons, and so you can see the hypocotyl right here in this particular graphic. And the radical is the embryonic root. So you can see the radical down here is the embryonic root. So this is showing you a little bit about a dicot seed. So if we look at the uh, outside parts, we have the seed coat, which is a protective covering. We have a little hole, which allows water to enter, called the micropile. And uh, we have where the seed was attached to... Um, the uh, parent plant, we have a little scar there called the seed scar. Here you can see the plumule, the embryonic stem, and you can see the radical, the embryonic root. And this is what it looks like in a little sequence from start to finish over here. I would be able to draw and label a seed that's probably in your study guide, so make sure you follow your study guide. This would be like what you would draw for the outside parts. This is what you would draw for the inside parts. Make sure you include your cotyledon, your embryonic stem, and your embryonic root. Make sure you have on the outside parts the seed coat. The little embryonic root can be seen, the little hole, the micropile that allows water in, and the seed scar. There is a series of events that occur in germination. It's, it's a very complex thing, this thing called germination. You know, some plants have to have fire to germinate. Some, uh, well, all of them have to have water to germinate. Some have to be buried, so they have to have the lack of light for a period of time. So there's many different uh, um, things or requirements that have to be in place in order for germination to occur. Water is one of the key impor important components, though. And when water is taken in by the seed, it's called imbib imbibition. And uh, what this water is going to do is it's going to 
cause a cascade of events to occur, one of the first things it does is cause gibberellins to be activated and made. Once these gibberellins are made, they actually cause the making of amylase, which is a, an enzyme that digests stored starch into maltose, which are glucose units stuck together. It's a disaccharide. The maltose will be absorbed by the young embryo, and the young embryo will make maltase, which is an enzyme enzyme to digest maltose, and it'll make it into glucose molecules. The glucose will then be used for cellular respiration uh, to fuel the plant to grow. So it'll be the fuel to make ATP so the plant can grow. And I just listed it out here in case you didn't take notes there. There's steps one, two, three, four, five, six, and it says exactly what I just said. And I thought I would just list it out to make sure that you have those particular notes. So the seeds are soaked in water. It activates the gibberellins. The gibberellin is a hormone. It activates amylase. Amylase is going to break down storage stored starch into maltose units. Maltose units are going to be broken down by maltase into glucose. Glucose is the fuel for cellular respiration to make ATP so the plant can grow. And this is just showing you a, a, a dicot, a sequence of a dicot uh, seed. So this is what it looks like and when it germinates it goes through and you can see the radical comes out. Eventually the radical comes out and you'll see that this part's going to be pulled up out of the soil. We have the cotyledons, the stored nutrients that will fuel the plant, uh, give it extra starch until it undergoes photosynthesis. And then over here, you can see the full-blown leaves that are uh, actually out and about. Uh, I would suggest that you grow some seeds. You know, if you take bean seeds and you're getting ready to have a bean dinner, take a few of those bean seeds, throw them in a plastic bag in a, in a paper towel and put some water in them and let it grow. Take a look at it and explore it for yourself and see how the plant unfolds. Well, that was a long lecture and an important lecture to talk about flowering plants. As usual, I encourage you to, um, to not feel alone. Email me if you have questions. Email other students. Work together on study guides. You know you can work on pairs and up to pairs on study guides. If you don't do the study guides, you're going to have an awful hard time uh, doing well on the test. So please make sure that you, um, you keep up with all your work, all your due dates. And uh, I will see you uh, next time.